Right. Good afternoon. I'm Melanie Koloski. Today's session will be Undertake Aircraft Underwater Escape and Survival, which is part of the elective unit AVIF 2014. Learning outcomes. Learning outcome one, prepare for aircraft ditching. Le learning outcome two is to undertake evacuation from the aircraft. Learning outcome three is to conduct the rescue recovery process. And learning outcome four is the control is to control survival hazards. The structure of this uh, presentation will um, will be aligned with. Uh, in chronicolo chronological order of the learning outcomes, incorporating both theory and case, stu uh, case studies, which give a real life uh, perspective on uh, ditchings that have occurred. The second part of the session uh, will focus on applying the theory in the form of assessment tasks such as questions, su such as Q and A as well as a short 10-minute uh, test, uh, which have the relevant diagrams um, and um, also give a bit of a hint to what the answer might be. Uh, so be I just wanted to run through a couple of things before I started this presentation. Uh, I am the delegated person in charge of um, emergency um, evacuation. So when you hear an alert tone, leave all your things on the desk and then follow me outside of the building in a single line and we will meet at the designated assembly area. Okay, so I'll begin with the reasons for ditching, uh, factors that affect the ditching, and announcement for ditching and survival in the water. So there are a variety of reasons why an aircraft might ditch. Some of them include running out of fuel, uh, uh, hijacking, uh, as well as um, critical structural damage that significantly significantly impacts the aircraft's ability to uh, keep flying. The challenge of landing on water is complicated by several um, several things, such as uh, bad, uh, very low visibility, um, the dark, so set of night time. Uh, stormy, unstable weather, um, and this is also uh, also malfunctioning flight instruments may be to blame as well. The, uh, the several case studies that are illustrated um, have varying levels of success and survival rates. And so the pilot in command is usually the one, is, He's entirely responsible for the entire functioning of the aircraft from pushback all the way to arriving at the um, destination. So when he uh, decides that there needs, to, there needs to be a ditching, he will um, prepare the whole cabin for ditching. And so one of the, which is learning outcome one, and this will include uh, putting on the fasten seatbelt sign, uh, telling passengers to fasten their seatbelts low and tight as regulated by the safety uh, demonstration which occurs at the start of the flight, as you all know. And in addition, before evacuation, uh, if, the, if it is night time or if the cabin is smoky for whatever reason, um, the rows, there will be illuminated, um, the illuminated rows to, uh, illuminated lights, sorry, to the uh, nearest exit, which will be pointed out by the cabin crew members. And then um, before, just before impact, people, uh, passengers uh, will get into what's called the brace position. This is to minimize the impact to the human body as hitting Hitting the water at, uh, is pretty much like hitting concrete and it depends on the speed and altitude but usually the higher the speed and the higher the altitude that the plane is coming from the harder the impact will be and particularly if the nose hits the water first 
then it's pretty much guaranteed that everybody doesn't survive as the plane will just like, the nose will just, it will hit the water so hard that it's impossible pretty much to survive such, an, such a landing on the water. And this is also kind of made worse by choppy seas because you have to kind of, uh, there's a particular process associated with ditching the plane. There's an actually scientific kind of, uh, you know, a, um, the right way to land onto the water. So uh, something to do with, uh, I think, on top of the swell. So, but then that's not the only problem. After everybody has survived the initial impact of the aircraft, um, aircraft ditching, the next problem lies uh, with the ocean itself. It may be very choppy, uh, not to mention very cold, which can result in hypothermia. Not to be confused with hyperthermia, which has got to do with extreme heat. Hypothermia is pretty much got to do with extreme cold. Uh, there are moderate forms of hypothermia, and there's also extreme uh, extreme hypothermia, which is characterized by semi-consciousness, erratic breathing, and in really severe cases, your heart stops and you just you pass away. These are the exit types on the Boeing 737-800 aircraft, which is, along with the Airbus A330-300, uh, is a very common aircraft type in Australian skies. Jetstar, sorry, Qantas, Virgin, um, and now Tiger Airways operate the 737-800, and Qantas operates the A330-300. They're two very uh, different aircraft. So the photo on the left is the 737 overwing exit. It has a, at the, so there's two doors at the front. So there's one, uh, one on the left and one on the right. So the left we call the passenger door. And then the second is called the service door. Yeah. And then you have two sets of uh, overwing exits, which is situated where the wings are. So there's uh, one, and then there's another one right behind it. And then you also have the rear passenger and service doors, which are called type one doors. And the overwing exits are called type three, and the front is type one as well. That's a 737. The Airbus, the Airbus A330-300 uh, doesn't have overwing exits. Instead, it has exit row seats. And then right next to that is a Jetstar A320 safety card. And the A320 is the main rival to the Boeing 737. It also has overwing exits. And the main requirement for sitting on an exit row seat, uh, which I've sat on in before, is that somebody must be physically fit, psychologically sound, and also of age. <laughs> so, How do they know if you're psychologically sound? Yeah, I guess I guess it's, no. I guess it's kind of got to do with maturity or something like that. Hence the age. I think psychological kind of ta like kind of ties in with age yeah, as well. Yeah. That's why. So people younger than fifteen can't sit at the exit because and they they can't have just, a budget to give every uh, every <laughs> passenger a <laughs> mental status. And then exam. elderly people obviously they don't put in the row either. No, yeah. it's, well yeah because they're they're more brittle and the they're going to slow down. The doors are about 16 kilos, aren't they? Yes, and oh yeah, no, that's that's a big one, the weight of the doors the as well too. The, the, um, the flight attendant asks whether they're prepared to participate in an evacuation. That's right. Exactly, yeah. and you must be you must be up to it. So obviously physical fitness is a big one, but age, age I'd say is kind of ties to the uh, psychological factors as well. So you can't be too, you have to, you can be, you can't be under 15, but then you can't be a certain, um, you know, older age as well. So you have to, you know, yeah, kind of like my age and above, like. And also, Ellie, I think in your previous training sessions with us, you've shown us sort of those who are maybe drunk and disorderly, are they so, uh, uh, you know, their, well, their <laughs> the, mental the state, you don't want. Yeah, the incapacitated. Yeah, the incapacitated. So someone who's had four Bloody Marys on the flight. Yes. Correct. So, it's so yeah, those one, you would not have them in But you know what, some aircraft do not serve alcohol at all, and that's Royal Brunei. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I don't float. Emirates float. <laughs> yeah, Emirates do, <laughs> but Brunei <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Why not? laughs> is uh, that's a complete the theocracy. Yeah. So the laws of that land are also that's apply right. to uh, the airline itself. So the minute you get on board, you're pretty much subject to their regulations. So, so if they have a same-sex snog on the flight, they get yeah, bored. Yeah, it's just <laughs> it, no, it's, 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 it's it's pretty much yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. But anyways, yeah. Thank so you. Yeah. you have to be you know of sound. You have to be oh. fit. You have to be of sound mind. So sober. Yes, you have to do. Be, yeah. You have to be sober, and you have to be um, of certain age as well. Because then the last thing you want is somebody being mentally or physically incapacitated when you're undertaking an evacuation. Um, and yeah, usually I think able-bodied able people actually evacuate first and then I think then disabled people. That's, I think that's the order of the um, evacuation so that they can help out the disabled people later rather than everybody just waiting for you know, yeah. disabled people yeah. to mm. exit. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. Okay. so. this leads us to case study one, which is the Powell Air Care flight to West Wind Ditching. Has anybody heard of this case? Has, has anybody heard of this before? Not so, does anyone know who Care Flight is? Care Flight Operate Air Ambulance Services, pretty much. Okay, right. So, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. So in 2009, a uh, Israeli in industry West Wind jet uh, was faring a very a seriously ill passenger. Uh, they had to refuel in um, Norfolk Island, which is in the Pacific Ocean, on the way to Sydney. But the pilot actually ran out of fuel. So he had, after four failed landing attempts over 45 minutes the plane ran out of fuel and so they had to ditch but the problem was this that it was very stormy that the seas were very rough and there was uh, very little visibility as well so he just he told the cabin you know to prepare to ditch in the ocean the plane did ditch in the ocean everybody survived though everybody no fatalities even though there was a seriously ill in, um, passenger Amazing. There was a doctor, a nurse, the patient's husband, and the pilot himself, mm -hmm. but all of them survived. The problem was afterwards, in um, usually you need a positioning beacon. Uh, aircraft have a minimum equipment list, which has mandatory uh, equipment that must be on board an aircraft, mm -hmm. particularly if you're flying over water. Um, that's, there's an even higher need. But the problem was this. Um, it was classified, the, the air ambulance service was classified as aerial work instead of, um, it should have been classified as charter and therefore because of that uh, important, uh, because of that uh, classification, uh, there was lower um, regulatory requirements regarding things like fuel and emergency equipment and everything. So the captain only had a torch, he didn't have flares, didn't have oh. any, yeah. He only really had his torch, and that's and he was just lucky that ha happened to be someone in the vicinity on their boat who rescued them. Um, there was actually a lawsuit against Pal uh, against uh, Care Flight and Palais by the nurse because she's got lasting psychological and physical injuries as a result of this accident because the impact was pretty much broke up the aircraft, as you can see. That's still at the bottom of the ocean. They didn't, because uh, usually after an accident, they take out they take out the aircraft and they examine it to see what exactly happened. But the main regulators in Australia, which are the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and ATSB, um, blamed the pilot. They actually blamed him for the accident, saying that he had insufficient fuel uh, calculations. Um, he didn't take any requirements that included circling around the island all the weather conditions that day. So he got a bit of flack from the regulators, but then the regulators got some flack from a uh, different body as well for actually just solely blaming the pilot but not actually taking into consideration the other factors that affected the ditching as well. 
So the, the main thing is that everybody survived this incident because ditchings don't usually end too well. Yeah, when I imagine that before ditching the pilot would have tried to have put the plane just above stall speed. Yes. To get it as close as possible, as mm -hmm. low as possible, but still be in control up to the point yes. of touching down in the water. Yes, but so he's, the, the impact was just, and plus you've got to take into consideration the state, the state of the sea as well. So when you're in the water, you have to, not only do you have to worry about low temperatures, but you have to worry about the general state where you are, how isolated or close to um, land you are, yes. and you know just a general weather as well, which it all added up if you think about it. So it's low visibility, stormy conditions, and not to mention it was obviously very cold. So that was, uh, that's case study one. Okay, so we've got a bit of question time, which is the first assessment task. So what are the two factors that led to the case study one ditching? That, like, 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 that's number one. Poor weather? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Main two factors as well. Which prevented landing, which meant he had to sea plane. Well, pretty much because... And you also visibility as well, because you do you are guided by your instruments. But if it's if it's uh, if you can't see, you can't see. So those, yep, yeah, that's correct. What are the two requirements for sitting in the exit row seat? Um, mentally sane and physically fit. <laughs> mentally sane, love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mentally yeah. sane. Certain age. <laughs> Well, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. It's um, yeah. So <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Go for it. Um, and obviously, guys, if you um, are confused about something, um, whenever whatever I'm talking about, just raise your hand up, and I'll answer your questions. I forgot to say that at the start of the session. Um, okay. Another question: What are the three examples of survival equipment that aids passengers and helps locate them? Oh, no. Whis a whistle? Well, yeah, that's number one. Torch. Yep. <laughs> Very funny. Um, well, yes, absolutely. And it needs to be functioning. Because from what I heard, uh, the nurse said that her vest was only half inflated. Okay. So I think there actually was an issue with the emergency equipment on board the yeah. aircraft, which it lacked. Which is odd because it's an air ambulance service and you've got, you know, the conditions of passengers are even more fragile than someone that's already healthy. You you think that'd be just a mandatory. So I'm not well, I'm not going to point fingers, but I do believe that there was a bit of issue with the regulations as well. In addition to the pilot, mm. the pilot had was partially to blame. But you can't, as a trainer, I can't. My my job is not to blame anybody, but just look at the factors that might have contributed to the accident, the ditching. So, what can extreme hypothermia result in? Give Death. three symptoms. No, I'm sorry. no, yep. Heart stops. Yep. Yeah. Well, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Shivering. Pretty much cut into the chase, definitely. Shivering. <laughs> Shivering. Pardon? Well, absolutely, yeah. Oxygen's not being pumped around to your vital. That's it. Down. The nurse over here's got it all sorted. <laughs> I love the technical, you know, definitions. <laughs> But um, yeah, pretty much. And then you've got moderate, then you've got moderate um, hypothermia, which is obviously less worse than extreme hypothermia, but still includes uh, involuntary shivering, um, a bit of irrationality, um, and they go, you do go a bit pale as well too. So this is case study two. I'm pretty sure that most people are familiar with this one. This actually happened in 2009, the same year that that Pal Air West Wind accident occurred in. This was actually a textbook example of a perfect ditching. A ditching obviously is not the most, you know, ideal situation to find yourself in. But the way that the pilot, how he put his aircraft down on, um, you know, on board, it was just commendable and every, every single person survived. No one died. Not even... The, from hypothermia or injuries, because the everything was just done by the book. This was um, the Hudson River incident. Pardon? Is this the Hudson River? That's right. This was the U.S. Airways Flight 1549, Airbus A320. Uh, so this just took off. The background is that this took off from LaGuardia Airport. Is, is anyone, does anyone know where LaGuardia is? 
New York City. So there's John F. Kennedy Airport, which is the main airport that has international and domestic. LaGuardia ha has domestic only. And then you've got Newark, which is in New Jersey, but that's part of New York. This plane took off and it hit a flock of birds and it suffered simultaneous twin engine failure. So rather than risk turning back and trying to land, which had enormous risk, the pilot decided the best way was to just ditch the plane on the river and so his actions, his actions actually saved everybody on board. And as you can see, you can see everybody uh, just getting out of the aircraft on top of the wings. So this aircraft had overwing exits as well, which is what we looked at um, when we saw the, I was talking about the exit types. Can I ask you something? Um, I think Ali would have been right in saying because it was a river, not the ocean, like the first example. Yeah, you know, it's like speed humps, and I can imagine it's the same storm and just landing on top. Here, the, the river was relatively flat. The rivers tend to be calmer. And that I think that had something advantage. to do with it as well. Gave well, absolutely. Chance. But yeah. the river's still absolutely freezing. It's a Hudson River. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what data it would have happened, but obviously. Oh, yes. There's a girl from The Voice who survived it. Yeah. No way. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she's singing in The Voice. On the US, on this song. Um, the Mm. Captain Sully has become a celebrity. Yeah, there's Captain, there's actually a movie. There's actually yes, a movie right. about uh, US Airways it's Flight 1549. Mm. Okay, the right. aircraft itself is actually preserved in a museum. Oh too. my god. Wow. So, That's cool. obviously it wasn't going to fly again. I think it was written off. Mm. But um, yeah, fantastic outcome. Um, mm. That was a successful ditching. The West Wind one, everybody survived, but there was a lot of, you know, there's people that still have lasting psychological and, you know, injury that requires constant treatment. Mm. So, mm. the pilot though is still flying today. He still retained his pilot license, but, mm. so that's a good thing. I think he had it revoked and then they gave it back to him on further evidence because another board actually pressed, uh, pressed ATSB and CASA to actually just, you know, re-look at the case again and see that there are other factors at play. So that was that one. This is, that was US Airways just then, so. And now we move on to case study three, which is the final case study. Ethiopian Airlines Flight 961, a Boeing, triple, uh, sorry, Boeing 767 200 ER, which stands for extended range. Has anybody heard of this incident? Uh, so this, um, this plane was hijacked actually by three Ethiopian citizens and they wanted the captain to fly to Australia. So they took off from Addis Ababa, which is the Ethiopian capital, I think bound for Nigeria. Uh, and they were flying over the Indian Ocean uh, when the hijackers just stormed in and they claimed to have, a, they threatened um, that they had a bomb on board which was proven false later on. But the captain told them that he, had no, he didn't have enough fuel to fly to Australia. So he tried to uh, indiscreetly, sorry, discreetly land at the nearest destination, which is in the Comoros Islands. Does anyone know where that is? It's off the coast of Africa. It's in um, the Indian Ocean. But as soon as he made his approach, the hijackers saw that, saw there was land coming up, so they tried to uh, intervene and so they were fighting over the controls. So the captain just tried to get the plane down into the ocean as close as possible to the beach. But here's the catch, everybody survived the impact, but unlike the West Wind accident, people, um, people ignored to, the advice to um, not inflate your vest until you evacuate, to, until you're out of the aircraft. So people inflated their vests and then drowned later uh, afterwards as a result of uh, panicking. Because you can imagine, like, if you're on the aircraft and water is filling up, that's your first thing to, is to panic. But so most of the fatalities were actually from the actual, um, yeah, just the inflation of the vests, Inside pretty much. The so they did quote like where they landed wasn't too deep, but. Some people, uh, it was just more to do with the inflation of this. So, I'll uh, show you, a, this is actually a live uh, video that was recorded by holiday makers on the beach when they saw the plane crashing. So, just um, 
bring that up. Chris? Chris, technical man. Just um, on the mirror, just, yeah, just. It's not a picture, that's actually a video. I know, but usually if there's a link, it will show up here. Does it? No. Okay. Alright. Cool. I'll just, you know. Um, Alright, there was, there was a video, but um, never mind. Uh, sorry, you pretty much know what happened in the plane. Um, it actually, it, the entire plane broke up. Um, but uh, people did, there were, there were survivors, but there were also fatalities as well. So this one is kind of different to the previous two studies.